Ruth chapter 1. Let's just read a few verses here. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain, na a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, when the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. All right, we'll stop reading there. Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless the study here tonight, and uh, Lord, you'd use it for your honor and your glory. May the saints of God here glean something from it this evening. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name and amen. Now, there's only two books, and you know that there's two books in the Bible that's named uh, for women, or named after women. Uh, one being Ruth here, the other being Esther. And uh, we know that in type, anyway, Ruth is a type of the, of the church, I believe, a church, uh, type of the bride of Christ. Uh, I believe Esther uh, to be a type of Israel. And um, so the Lord has included them in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, Old Testament canon. Um, Ruth as the church needed a kinsman redeemer. Boaz fulfilled that type, and being a kinsman redeemer, uh, she redeemed Ruth, all that was Naomi's and Ruth. And uh, so there's great typology coming through here in, in those kind of things. And again, that's not necessarily going to be the gist of the study. Um, but uh, some interesting things, I think, anyway, or some things maybe I hadn't thought of uh, in putting it forth this way. The first thing I want to say is that this story is a real story. You know, the Bible is full of parables. Uh, some of the parables that, uh, some of the uh, true stories that uh, is told in this book, uh, some of the correctors, some of the fundamentalists, and some of the false religions uh, refer to them as parables, and they're not. Uh, this is not a parable. It's not, just a, it's not just a romance story. It's not just a love story. Though uh, there are some basis of books that's been written that I'm sure uh, their, their uh, original thought came, uh, if not from this love story, from another one in the Bible. But this is a true story. And uh, it's not a, not a made-up story. It's not a, uh, it's not a uh, folk tale. Uh, it's not a, uh, you know, something passed down from generation to generation to teach a truth. It's a real story. It's a true story. It's got real people in it. Uh, they have real genealogies. Look at, um, look at chapter 4. There's genealogies given here. Ruth chapter 4. And uh, pick it up in verse number 16. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There's a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Hezron. Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Amenadab. And Amenadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz. And Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. That genealogy is backed up in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Perez, and Zerah of Thamar, and Perez begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, 
And Aaron begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Anason, Anason begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias, and Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and so forth and so on. So the New Testament backs up the genealogy that was given in Ruth. Now some folks will say, well, this is just a book and some of it's true and some of it's not and those kind of things. But you know, there was a time, uh, probably not just limited to America, but there was a time that if a genealogy was written down in a family Bible, if dates of births and weddings and all those things was recorded in a, in a Bible, in a family Bible somewhere, that those things were accepted as legit, legitimate documents proving the heritage of that person and their birth and their date, those kind of things. So somebody said, well, that's just a book. Yeah, but it ain't just any book. And everything in this book is true and right. Uh, it's a true story, real people, with real genealogical records, real places. You have Bethlehem Judah mentioned there. It's mentioned in Judges chapter 17, back a few pages. It's mentioned elsewhere, I believe, as well. Judges chapter 17, verse number 8. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. So there it's mentioned there. Um, it still exists today. There was two Bethlehems. There was a Bethlehem south of uh, Jerusalem and there was a Bethlehem north of Jerusalem. I forget what it was. Bethlehem, I don't remember what it was. But there was two of them. This is a reference, I believe, to the one south of Jerusalem. And then there's Moab. And Moab is mentioned throughout the Bible, but Moab is a nation or doesn't exist today. I don't think that there's any modern day map that you would find Moab on. I may be mistaken about that. I didn't research it in depth. But uh, that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Ashland, Kentucky wasn't always Ashland, Kentucky. At its founding, it was called Pogue's Landing, named after a family that settled here. There's a place called... Um, and I may have the wrong name. Uh, I think it was called Geigersville, I believe. And it was kind of in between Ashland and Catlicksburg. If I've got the wrong name, there was an, another town in there. It doesn't exist today. It's not on any modern day map. It got absorbed with Ashland and Catlicksburg. <laughs> and the lines divided. Now Ashland butts right up against Catlicksburg and there you are. But that doesn't mean that those places didn't exist. They just got absorbed. They just got renamed. And such it is with these places. So this is a true story. It's a real story. It's not a made up story. It's a tragic story. Um, look at chapter 1 verse 1 we read there. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. There's a famine. They're leaving a famine. Now I've never been one to beat up on, take your Bible to Amos. I've never been one to beat up on uh, um, Elimelech too much. I've never been in a famine. I've read about famines. Not a pretty thing. So what happens in famines? People start eating one another. That's just a fact. They do. Right? Famine's not a famine's not a good thing. I'll get to Amos here in a minute. I've passed it up two or three times. Amos. And uh, the potato family, family, a famine of when, um, in, uh, yeah, family. The potato, Mr. Potato Head, Mrs. Potato Head. Um, the, uh, potato, the potato famine, 
over in uh, Ireland, I believe it was. And uh, people starving to death and stuff over there, you know, and all those things. Amos chapter 8, verse number 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst of water, but a hearing of the words of the Lord. Now, this famine back here in Ruth is not the famine spoken of here in Amos. But there's worse famines than a famine of bread. The worst famine a country can have is a famine of the Word of God. And you know what Elimelech did? Elimelech, Elimelech traded one famine for another. He went to a godless country. He went to a place that didn't worship God, didn't worship the true God, and he left a famine of bread and went to a country where there was a famine of God. They didn't know God. Now listen, folks, I know sometimes you've got to make moves. Sometimes, um, sometimes you know, you've got to leave an area and move to another place. Your job relocates you and all kinds of different things. But if you're not a preacher and called to preach and God ain't moving you to start a church, there's one thing you better figure out. Is there any place for you to go to church where you're getting ready to move to? Because if there ain't no place to go to church where you're getting ready to move to, and God ain't laid on your heart to start a church there, you probably ought to stay put. Or go someplace else. Most important thing in life is your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the most important things in your family's life is the church you attend. And I'm not putting the church on a pedestal. I'm not putting any pastor on a pedestal. I'm just telling you, I've seen it too many times. I've seen people leave and go to work in a place where, where God wasn't there. There wasn't any place for them to worship or assemble. And families ended up in divorce. Kids ended up in a mess. And you say, what happened? They went to better themselves, but they ended up hurting themselves. You say, what is that? That's a tragic story. And it's a tragedy that Elimelech left left, uh, left uh, uh, Israel, left Bethlehem, Judah. Now God took it and God worked it out and all those kind of things, but it was a tragedy that he, that he uh, brought his family into. Tell you another tragedy. They left a sojourn, but they ended up staying. Verse 1 and 2 says they left a sojourn. But you come on down there and Elimelech, and, or not Elimelech, um, um, the two sons, Malon and Chilion. Uh, they stayed long enough for them boys to get wives down there. So you say, what did they do? They might have went to sojourn, but they, they settled in down there. They stayed there. And you know, sometimes God might lead you in a place somewhere along the line to sojourn. But not necessarily to stay. I don't believe God led Elimelech and Naomi here. I don't believe that he did. I believe they left the will of God and God and maybe the permissive will of God. I don't know. But... They left long enough that those sons grew and married wives of that place and makes reference there to 10 years. Say, so how long were they down there? I don't know how long they were down there. But a sojourn is just a short stay. Just going to go down there long enough for things to pick back up in Israel and then we'll go back. They used to teach, they used to teach, uh, they say they used to teach in eastern Kentucky here and uh, western West Virginia and those places, reading and writing in Route 23. And there wasn't any jobs down there except for coal fields, you know, and those kind of things. So people would get uh, their, their high school diplomas, some of them, and they'd go off up north. And they'd go to Columbus, Ohio. And they'd go to Dayton, Ohio. And they'd go to Michigan. And they'd go up north. You know, a lot of them folks, still the families are still there. I got family that lives in Columbus, Ohio. You say, why? Because my aunts and uncles left this area and went to Columbus, Ohio to get a job and, and move up there. You ever notice that there's kind of a line that goes across Ohio and it goes right through Columbus and how much more southern those people south of Columbus are than the people north of Columbus are? It's just fact. That's the way it is. What I'm saying is sometimes you go to sojourn but you end up staying. Gets you in trouble. Another tragedy. Their son's married wrong. There in verse number four. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. That was forbidden. Them Jews wasn't to marry anybody outside of, Jew, outside of Israel. They were to keep that marriage pure. Keep it right. Now, as far as I can see from this Bible and New Testament, you can't go a hard line and say races can't mix. But when races mix, there'll be trouble. There'll be problems. 
that you wouldn't occur that wouldn't occur if you hadn't mixed. And you gotta sort all those kind of things out. But I'll tell you one line you can draw. If you're saved, you ain't got no business getting hooked up with an unsaved person. Now that's a line that is not muddy, it's not dark, it's not, it's not gray, it's nothing else. Listen, don't you young people in here that are saved get messed up with an unsaved person. Do you know how many women have said, oh, I can change him, and spent just, you know, 40, 50 years of just, just horrible, a horrible marriage, sometimes drunkards, sometimes gamblers, sometimes good man, raised a good family. Never did get saved, never did get in church, never did get the kids in church. The kids grow up and just be a bunch of hellions. You say, why? Because that woman married somebody she loved, but he wasn't a Christian. Thought she could change him. She couldn't change him. Men, same way. You young fellas in here, don't you get mixed up with some? Why do people date? Most, I mean, in my day and age, anyway, people dated, they were, they were looking for a potential wife. Okay, I, I, things, I know we're not living in the 70s anymore. And the world has changed. <laughs> but if you go out on what we call a date just to have a good time, you're going to get in trouble just about every time. Or it'll lead to trouble somewhere down the road. That's why two young people shouldn't be left alone together. You say you're old-fashioned. Yep, I sure am. <laughs> what I'm getting at is this. If you don't want to marry somebody that's unsaved, don't date somebody that's unsaved either. See, what happened to them boys? They married wrong. See, what was it? Tragedy. Tragedy. I'm, I'm much more stern on it than that. I don't think Methodists ought to marry Baptists and Baptists ought, ought not marry uh, Presbyterians and right on down the line. And you say, why is that? Because I've seen it too many times where a Baptist married a Methodist and he won't go to her church and she won't go to his church and they don't go to church any place and the kids grow up lost and die and go to hell. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's right. See, so what was the tragedy? They married wrong. Another tragedy. They buried their love, the love of their lives they buried there. Naomi buried her husband. I have no doubt Naomi loved her husband. have no doubt about that whatsoever. She buried him down there in Moab. You say, was Naomi wrong in any of that? I don't know. She went where her husband went. Women supposed to follow their husband, ain't they? But she buried her love down there. Those two women, Orpah and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Ruth. So what happened? They buried their loves down there. I think they probably loved those men. But they buried them down there in Moab. And then in verse number 5, you know what you find? And Malon and Chilion died, and both of them, and the, women was le uh, the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. You got Naomi there alone. And Naomi's alone in a foreign land. Nobody to care for her. Nobody to take care of her. What a tragedy. You got those two women, Moabite women, left alone. No husbands. Now they're in their own land. Somebody probably take care of them. Maybe they find another husband. I don't know. But you got a woman there and, and uh, Naomi and Naomi's alone. You say, why? Because she went down into a foreign country, a country they wasn't supposed to have anything to do with, and sojourned there and dwelled there with her husband. And uh, it may all lay at her husband's feet, but there she was caught up in the tragedy. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the truths about tragedies is a lot of times there's other people involved in our tragedies. It's just not me. Some people say, well, I just live to myself. I'll live any way I want to live. Listen, you don't live to yourself. No man dies to himself. No man lives to himself. And, buddy, you affect other people whether you think you affect other people or not. And the tragedies in my life will affect my wife and my kids and my grandkids. And it'll affect this church because I'm your pastor. Tragedies in your lives affect other people. You say, what is that thing? It was a tragic story. I'll tell you something else, though. It was a touching story. You see some things in here, buddy. It just, I mean, to me, I, I, it amazes me. Uh, Ruth's devotion to Naomi. That's a pretty touching thing, ain't it? It is to me. I don't, I don't like Hallmark, Hallmark movies. I don't like Anna Green Gables. I'm just, I'm just a man, okay? You ladies like that stuff, more power to you. Carol watches some of those things, but not when I'm around. 
If I'm going to watch something, I want blood and guts. But anyway, Ruth's devotion to Naomi, verse 15, chapter 1. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back and be Orpah, gone back unto her people, unto her gods. Notice that. Return thou after thy sister-in-law, that her gods will be important here after a while. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following thee. After thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people, and look at it, thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death uh, part thee and me. When she saw that, uh, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. You say, what is that? That's devotion, man. That's love for a mother-in-law. You hear all those bad mother-in-law stories? I had a good mother-in-law. I had a great mother-in-law. I miss my mother-in-law. I really do. She was a good woman. She was good to me. She even took them outside sometimes. That's a good mother-in-law. <laughs> so Ruth's devotion to Naomi, that's a touching, that's a touching story. Well, what about Naomi's concern for Ruth? Look at chapter 3. Naomi's concern for Ruth. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred... With whose maidens thou wast, behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in, and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Now there was nothing out of the way in what was going on there uh, that Naomi was telling Ruth to do as part of the customs and things of the land and all that stuff. And you say, what is that? But it shows you that Naomi had a concern for Ruth. It was a reciprocal, it was a reciprocal love between uh, a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. That's pretty touching. All right, then look at chapter 2, verse number... Chapter 2, verse number 16. For the sake of time, we'll not read the whole account. Most of you here, probably all of you here are familiar with it. If not, you can, you can read it at home. But Ruth has uh, ventured into Boaz's field. And Boaz has taken note of her. And uh, verse 14 says, And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, Come thou hither. And eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean, even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. You say, what is that thing? That's Boaz's grace to Ruth. Ruth was a foreigner. She was a Moab. She's a Moabite. Here she is gleaning in the field. And you say, what happens with that thing? Boaz has heard of her devotion to Naomi. And he's taken note of it. And you know what he's doing? He's showing great grace to Ruth. Now, that's a, that's a beautiful picture of, of Jesus Christ in the church. Didn't God show you great grace? Hasn't God let you go into some places you didn't deserve to go? Hasn't God along the line dropped you a few handfuls of purpose along the way? You say, what is that? That's grace. And Boaz here is showing Ruth grace in those respects. And then lastly, it's a triumphant story. Don't you love a story with a happy ending? I know you ladies do. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> Most people like a story with a happy ending. You know, I, even if it's blood and guts, I like to see the hero alive at the end of the show. You know, those, those kind of things. Like a happy ending. <laughs> and here's a triumphant story. See, so what were they triumphant over? Well, they were triumphant over some costly mistakes. 
Remember those things back there in point number one? They left God's, they left God's land and went to a land of godlessness. A land that didn't recognize them. Naomi survived that. Her husband didn't, and her sons didn't, but she did. Uh, marrying in the wrong place. The wrong people, I should say. Those boys married in the wrong, in the wrong people. You say, what about that thing? Well, something good came out of it. There was triumph in the end. She became, she became devoted to Naomi. That led to her being put into the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Triumphant over bitterness. Now folks will differ about what they think about this. I think Naomi was bitter. Go back to chapter 1. They're back to Bethlehem now in verse number 19. So the, they too, Ruth and Naomi, so they too un, uh, went until they came to Bethlehem and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So, no, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. You see that thing up there? The Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. It looks to me like Naomi's bitter over what's happened and what's befell her. She was obedient, it appears to me, that she was obedient to, uh, to her husband. She followed him down into a foreign land. He died there. The two sons married down there, and they died there. And there she's left alone with nobody to care for her in a foreign land, nobody to take care of her. And now she comes back, she comes back uh, home and she comes back empty. And not only does she come back empty, she comes back with, with, less, than she, uh, with less than she left with. And she, you say, what is that? She's bitter over that. Do you know how many people don't get over their bitterness? Do you know how many people that root of bitterness rises up and chokes them?